Camelot 331 here, and today I'm in the wild, the straight up wild, where all the beasts and the rocks are, and all the legendary video games. So today, I'm looking for the best game ever. And what game is that? That game is Halo 2. So let's see what we can find. Back in 2004, Halo 2 had some extremely big shoes to fill, following the blockbuster that was Halo Combat Evolved. It had the difficult task of one-upping its predecessor. Needless to say, after making Microsoft a bajillion dollars, they had leeway and publisher support to be more ambitious with the sequel. And that's how you get the tale of two cities. One half of the game starring as an ultra good guy fighting for a militaristic society that wants to spread out into the universe. And the other half starring a morally ambiguous alien who goes on suicide missions in the name of a theocratic misled government. Today we know that both of these societies pretty much suck, but back then we had just discovered the tip of the iceberg. By being able to get a glimpse of both socio-political environments, we were able to get a really good look at Halo and the world at which it was in. We learn that the rulers of the covenant are not guided by God, but by their own greed. By the beginning of the second act in the game, the Arbiter, to Quarantine Zone, we know that the covenant aren't exactly sure of what the rings are capable of doing. Or rather, the prophets won't reveal the truth. Things get way grayer as the story progresses. And whether you like it or not, being able to step inside the Arbiter's shoes allows you to take that first step in uncovering a livable, breathable galaxy on par with Star Wars. Bungie were bold enough to tell the story of both sides, and it pays off incredibly well. While Halo Combat Evolves Tale is in large part an adventure narrative, Halo 2 is just a little bit more. You could say the real story in Halo 2 is about the Arbiter and him reclaiming his honor. A 15 level epic about one character's place in society and that society's place in the universe. Most importantly, it answers the question that was set in place at the beginning of the game. Is the covenant worthy of going on the great journey? I think we all know the answer at the end of the game. Is the Arbiter an honorable warrior fighting for the greater good? By the time the credits roll, he indeed is. The Arbiter and his society has changed, and that is the narrative arc in Halo 2. Halo 2 is the biggest leap and narrative Bungie has ever performed. This is why it takes its place as the best game in the Halo series. Oh, Lord, all this game hunting it's got me <laughs> hot. <laughs> What's this? What is this buried deep, deep within the earth of the earth? Could this be? Uh, this is not it. This is, this is, this is not it. So I feel like we're getting closer. Or maybe, maybe we took a step back. I don't know. But that game's terrible. Eutechnics, did you know Eutechnics, the people that made Ride to Hell, also was signed to a three year deal with NASCAR to make NASCAR games? NASCAR is a multi billion dollar corporation, <laughs> and they picked Big Mother Truckers and Ride to Hell. That's absolutely ridiculous. The search continues off into the wild that is definitely not a park that you can just go to. It's secret. <laughs> now let's talk about multiplayer. Halo 2's multiplayer was both authentically revolutionary and the best online console shooter that has ever existed. I knew Halo 2's multiplayer was likely to be good because it's 
LAN only predecessor had me and my friends learning the basics of LAN and network cabling and regularly rearranged our houses into giant wired battlegrounds. The promise of doing this online was huge. Halo 2 wasn't just the only reason I bought my first Xbox Live subscription. It was the reason I got broadband. It dragged me and a generation of gamers through the rabbit hole into the bittersweet connected world beyond. Halo 2 was balanced and level in a way that encouraged skill and strategy. Starting weapons were standardized, while more powerful weapons were to be fought over on the map. Deathmatch became a matter of territory and tactics. The game offered no geography-beating power-ups like flight or speed, making knowledge of fleet-footed navigation absolutely crucial. And there was skill-based matchmaking, which ensured a steady curve of challenging opponents, which was actually skill-based because your rank would fall if you lost matches, in sharp contrast of the accumulative well done in modern games today. Halo 2 wasn't afraid to tell you that you've gotten worse. <laughs> its multiplayer was an elegant bear box. Learning its depths took time, and its complexities were unlocked by patience and ability, rather than pure investment of time and the XP that that would bring. Of course, if you're going to play a game of territory and tactics, the place you play it in becomes extremely crucial. And that's why another key element of Halo 2 was its selection of maps. My friends and I spent the mass majority of our time playing 4 on 4 Slayer on small to medium sized maps. And while not every Halo 2 map was classic, the very best was designed with a tight asymmetrical balance that brilliantly complemented the game's elegant level playing field approach. The interlocking platforms and shortcuts of lockout, the opposing sniper towers and dipped bowl of ascension, the tense narrow corridors and corner cover of turf. These are small patches of geography that even now browsing images to refresh my memory unfolds my mind into tactical maps of kill boxes safe zones, entry points, and defendable strongholds. These places are as real to me as the room I sit in now or the street outside. The result was a compelling game that called us online every single night, which for most of us was a completely new pattern of play. Halo 2 introduced us to a new vocabulary and a new kind of anguish. As the first of its kind, a truly mass market online shooter, the game was beset by foul play. We learned about bridging, standby buttons, noob combo, swap snapping, and many other cheats and exploits that either took the game and bent it slightly or turned it into outright crookery. <laughs> the hard edge ranking system gave the competition meaning, but it also meant players would destroy the basis of that competition just to boost the number that defined them. Sometimes entire nights were spent waiting for a game where, where people would come in that was evenly matched, that was not cheating. And sometimes that night never came. <laughs> Still, we played every night because that number, that ranking, defined us as well. I played so much, night after night, neglecting high school to chase that elusive winning streak that would take us past the mark of a quality Halo player. A rank 25. And on to numbers that struck us in fear as we sat in a Halo lobby. And that is rank 30 and beyond. What I do know is that the pursuit of this new rank led me to all sorts of new and strange relationships. We're all familiar now with how games have such a mixed diversity of nationalities and languages. Social confrontations of everyone from middle schoolers to the middle aged. One of my biggest friendships came with a teenager that I only knew as Biggs 16. Sometimes I wonder how Big 16, or known as Biggs 29 probably now, I wonder how he's doing. I never really think about that rank 30 and beyond anymore, except to marvel at how important it seemed back then. Telling players how good they really are at a game is really unfashionable now. And gradually, Halo has kind of followed suit. Over the years, the series' points of differentiation has kind of been eroded down to nothingness. With Call of Duty-inspired loadouts, perks, and killstreaks just being thrown into the game to kind of mess with the even-sided pace and just make things m more fast and just stupider. 
Now Halo is just a barking arcade of head pats and ADD reinforcement. We've lost something so intangible that used to happen with four guys on lockout with BRs and grenades with a kill count to 25. The ever swinging sense of paralysis and power, of gridlock and frenzy, to which no game with a jetpack will ever come close. Come here. Come. What? Me? Yes. There it is. I found it. Finally, the greatest game. And all you have to do is walk down this way and pick it up. Come on. Yeah, that doesn't seem like a good idea, listening to a, a scary, ominous voice tell me to come down a scary, ominous hole area. No worries. It'll be fine. I won't do anything, I promise. I think I'll chance it. Don't kill me, spooky voice. All I want to do is relive my childhood. I have just what ominous voice guy needs. I just gotta time it. Perfectly. Finally, after hours of searching, I finally have my hands on the greatest game of all time. And stupid ominous voice guy thought he was slick, but that was way easier than I thought it was going to be. So it's all good. You fool. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, ominous voice guy. You only have one way out of this. What, what is it? What do I got to do? Hopefully, it's not get naked. But I will get naked. I will get naked. You have to play the song. Play the song? The, the Halo song? Yes. But... I haven't played it in so long. I don't even remember any of it. <laughs> this is dumb. <laughs> I guess I could try. I gotta do it for Master Chief. I gotta do it for the Chief, man. I gotta at least try. But I don't even have my guitar with me. But I do keep a spare. <laughs> 